All right. Um, I haven't posted all the bacteriology lectures so far, but I will definitely uh, post it today. So this basically is a, I would usually call a bridge lecture between immunology and microbiology. We did cover chapter 20. Okay, uh, let's talk of commensal. Uh, chapter 20 was in-class activity, paired activity. That's what I said the other day. You just have to pay attention. Uh, so, uh, commensals. Commensal is a concept that you have to have uh, for bacteriology. And if you look at uh, the definition of what commensal mean, basically, it means one who eats at the same table. And uh, we talk of commensal and pathogenic microbial flora in humans. Again, um, I'll just warn you that uh, most of the bacteriology slides are high content cramming material. And there are a lot of stuff that you need to do. So I would pay attention to uh, some of the important concept forming things that I'm going to talk about. And then you need to do the rest as far as memorization and cramming is concerned. Now, this whole concept of commensal bacteria, right now I think you may have got this idea that bacteria is bad. Bacteria is something harmful. Bacteria is there for our immune system to fight against and so on and so forth. But when we talk of commensal bacteria, we are going to talk of something basically which is good, something that is there, and we cannot do anything about that. So they are basically are with us for good. And most of the recent developments that are happening in medicine are related to bacteriology, especially commensal bacteria. Now, if you were to look at this particular slide over here, and this is coming from uh, Nature Medicine, of course, one of the top journals. So if you look at the human cells that we have in our body, so they are 10 to the 13 human cells. So in a normal body, we have 10 to the 13 human cells. On the same body, we carry 100 times more, 10 to the 14, microbial cells. So that's the whole concept you have to understand that uh, we have more microbes on our body than the cells that we carry. If that is the case, we already did a human genome project and we found out about like 20,000 to 25,000 human genes there. But we also have a project whereby we can also do a genetic study of the microbes present on our body. We call it human microbiome. And that was a big project started like a couple of years ago, but it's now completed. And that's where personalized medicine, pharmacogenomics, that's the future of pharmacy that you will see in a couple of years. So you can see from here, uh, again, basic concept, your skin and mucosa are a barrier between yourself and your inner environment. Also keep this in mind that when we say you are protected and you have a barrier, this means that all this bacteria that I'm talking about still is potentially outside your body. This bacteria, virus, fungi, is basically attached to your mucosa or the skin, okay? So you can see we either have a skin as a protective layer or we have a mucosa as a protective layer. And then there are many factors that influence 
what type of bacteria do we have on our body and what do they do and what can we do with them. So there are many different factors but I think I would want you to pay attention to diet. So your diet will determine what kind of bacteria you have in your body. If you take antibiotics, of course, it's going to kill many bacteria, your hygiene, urbanization, family size, and so on and so forth. So all these bacteria basically send a signal to your immune system, and then the immune system would respond. Okay? So again, coming from the idea that overzealous use of antibiotics is not good, that also is coming from this standpoint that if you use a lot of bacteria, you will, can you hear me in the back, you have a problem? You cannot hear me in the back? I can turn it off and speak louder, probably that's here. Or turn this on. Okay. Does it sound a little bit better? Yeah. Okay. Now you can see from here that, uh, so this is the basic concept you have to have that uh, once you are born, you acquire a population of these microbial organisms and that will stay on you forever. There's nothing you can do about that. And you should not. Because if you start messing up with those bacteria, then you may have a problem because what will happen is you will put yourself to a risk of cardiovascular, metabolic, and other inflammatory diseases. So what I'm trying to say is these commensal bacteria and I use bacteria as a word because we used to call them normal flora, are your friends. That's the whole concept you have to have. Now also keep in mind that not all bacteria are your friends. The term that we normally use, some bacteria are pathogens. These bacteria are the troublemaker, they cause problem. But mostly commensal bacteria, you can see from here, are your friends. And these are the bacteria they are considered as a protective bacteria. And they are there for a good reason. And right now, most of the research is taking place on these commensal bacteria. What do they do? How do they do? And uh, how our immune system is basically educated by that. Now, some concept forming uh, slides, as I said earlier, we have trillions of microbes that include bacteria, fungi, and viruses, and they all are associated, intimate association with our body called human microbiome. So we can do genetic analysis, and we have done it. So what it suggests to you, each one of us, if we were to run your human microbiome, we can collect the data as to what do you have on your body and your skin. Okay, and of course each one of us would be different. Now also keep in mind that uh, this collection of microbes basically living in and on our body isn't random. So we have acquired things. Just imagine the babies, for example, intrauterine life, they are sterile. They should not have any bacteria. The moment you come into this world, you basically acquire a set of bacteria and microbes which will stay with you for the rest of your life. And that's what we need to learn. How do they do that? Now, again, a part of innate immunity. You can see from here that Though these microbes are sitting on our skin and mucous, mucous membrane, but they basically are there to educate our immune system. So our immune system is coming, cells of immune systems are coming at those barriers, skin and mucosa, and there where they get the inform information as to how should they respond. 
And uh, if you look at the major barriers that we have in terms of uh, protection, we have nasal passages, we have mouth, lungs, skin, gastrointestinal tract, and urogenital tract. So these are the outlets, the human outlets, they are there, and that's where bacteria will try to gain entry. Okay? Now, if you were to, to run a genetic analysis, which they have done, so a human body basically is about 25% human cells. If they were to run a genetic code on you, they will find out 25% of you are you, what you consider you are, and 75% of you is microbe. So you can see we have fungal, we have, this is human 25%, like one-fourth, and the major part is bacteria. So we are being influenced by this bacteria. To such an extent, if you want to, like for example, obesity is associated with these bacteria. Your weight is associated with this bacteria. Your uh, stress level is associated with this bacteria. Your other diseases are associated with this bacteria because these bacteria are the trendsetters. Okay? Now, if you were to count the cells, which they have done it for you, you can see our bodies have 37 trillion cells, and uh, 100 trillion, basically, are microbes. So if you were to take these microbes and weigh them, so they come out by 2.5 pounds of weight of bacteria. So it's a lot of weight. It's a lot of weight. And then again, uh, if you were to look at in terms of volume, 99%. And again, as I said earlier, you have to understand this concept before you go. And this will guide you to quite a few answers that you may have for patients, for over-the-counter drugs, and so and so forth. Okay? So the idea is that... Uh, I think 2009, if I believe uh, correctly, that's where they initiated, uh, NIH initiated this project. And right now what we have is that we have a, like a Google, like a, you know, big robots. So we'll take samples from different parts of your body and run them through. And we can do a gene al analysis and for every human being. And that's what has been done right now, right? If you were to look at the data, of course it's all, we call it pharmacogenomics. And as I said earlier, this is something you will see next 10 years coming for all different parts of medicine, pharmacy, and so on and so forth. This is how it's going to look like. So if you were to run that for the whole body, what they normally do is that they will take swab from all of your openings and run for the bacterial DNA. And you can see from here, they have a chart a map of diversity in human microbiome. So you will have a set of bacteria sitting on your skin, mucous membrane, so and so forth, and they can pretty much find out. And they will also tell you whether it's normal or abnormal. Because some of the bacteria may not belong to a particular area. So we need to know, for example, the part of today's lecture is I want you to know at least uh, the term that we say, what is the normal flora on your skin? What you should have as a protective bacteria on the skin. What's your normal flora of your anterior nares? What's your normal flora of your mouth? What is your normal flora of urogenital tract? And so on and so forth. So once we determine what is normal, then we can go for what is abnormal and start treating it. That makes sense? So you can see from here, uh, we talk of commensal microbes. Some of the microbes which are there, as I said, good bacteria. Then again, also keep in mind another concept, and I'm going to go through this concept in my next uh, 30 minutes or so, so you try to memorize. These are facts as well, that if you have 100 good bacteria on your body, you want them all to be on your body. If you overzealously want to remove it, you know, using all different kind of gadgets and washing and so on and so forth, so what may happen is that you will remove your friends, and once you remove your friends, those vacant spots will be taken up by your enemies, and they will cause a disease. Does that make sense? 
Okay, so that's the whole idea. Let me go through objectives. I'm going to talk about normal uh, flora today. And again, uh, I would want you to make your own charts to try to memorize uh, what is the normal bacteria flora of different parts of the body. For example, if you go to a ophthalmology ward, for example, to see patients infected with an eye, and they take the swab of an eye, and they say, Staph aureus is present. Now the question is, is Staph aureus normally present over here, or something came out of somewhere? So you have to make sure that you differentiate between commensal as compared to non-commensal, because you cannot start treat treating a patient just because the bacteria is there on the exterior, correct? And then again, I'll talk about some of the effects of antibiotics and um, some of the effects that you will see. Uh, how many of you had a chance to look at this lecture before you came into this class today? Honestly, other than downloading and printing, I said look at the lecture. So no hand down, only one, okay, that's fine. But uh, what I would warn you is that because it's a high content matter, immunology basically was a little bit conceptual. This one is memorization. So right from the word go, start cramming and memorizing and doing whatever you need to do because uh, this is going to be tough. Okay. Now, what is infection? What is the term? Concept-wise, I already told you that you have more bacteria on your body than your cells. If I isolate a bacteria from your mucous membrane or skin, does it mean that you are infected? No. Okay, so keep that in mind. Now this is a protective layer. We have skin and mucous membrane, and you can see infection and shedding. As a rule, all our tissues are sterile. You name a tissue, brain, liver, heart, everything is sterile. But keep in mind, the openings into our body are not sterile. Okay, so mouth, anal canal, urogenital region, skin, they basically are not sterile. So they are filled with bacteria. Now these bacteria get attached to these places and sometimes they are shed off as well. We call shedding. So what may happen is that you have a bacteria in your mouth and this bacteria can travel all the way from your mouth and be passed in your feces because it goes through the alimentary tract. Okay? And also remember some of the physiological things that are happening. For example, urogenital tract. Right? You have anterior urethra and you have uh, bladder. And then bladder is connected to ureters and ureters are connected to, to the kidneys. Now normally, uh, you may have some bacteria sitting on your anterior urethra. Right? Because of the environment, because of the outlet. And also keep in mind that the continuous flushing of urine will wash them away. Okay? You have bacteria on your conjunctiva, but the continuous lacrimation will wash those away. Okay? You have bacteria in your mouth and these bacteria are moving forward with the food. So the air you breathe, the food you take, you touch something, there are millions and millions of bacteria over there. But the challenge is that your uh, commensal bacteria make sure they would not let any other bacteria, bad guys, to come over and take this part. So that's like a concept you have. Uh, the only exception though is if, for example, if it's a vector there like a mosquito, and this mosquito bites into your vessel in your blood. Blood is normally sterile or not? Sterile. Okay, so that will be introduction of a microorganism into your cell. That is infection. Okay, now you really have to weigh things out in terms of the benefits and losses. I just told you that there are 1,000 more bacteria on your cell as compared to your own cell. Now, as long as these bacteria are sitting on your skin and mucous membrane, you are okay. 
when your immune system gets down and this bacteria passes this barrier through the mucous membrane or through your skin and gets into your body, that is now a friend changed into a foe. Right? This type of thing we call opportunistic bacteria or opportunity, for example, you cut yourself. If you cut yourself, your skin is full of bacteria, now the bacteria will move in and cause problems. Okay? So that's kind of a relationship that you will see we call commensalism, parasitism, and mutualism. So what's happening is that we have evolved to live with this bacteria in harmony. There's no problem with that. They actually assist us. They are good for us. So the message for today's lecture will seem to you, commensal bacteria are your friends, and you cannot get rid of them, and you should not get rid of them. Right? If you do that, for example, overuse of antibiotics, you will put yourself in trouble. If you wash yourself too much and you remove all those good bacteria, you are in trouble. Right? So there has to be a critical balance that you have to have in terms of normal immune function. Okay? And then again, you can see some of the bacteria are there. The highest number of bacteria all of us carry is in colon. And then again, there are many functions for that. I'll discuss in a while. But they are there in our colon, within our cell. But since they don't pass the mucous membrane, they still technically are outside of our body. But if you have ulcer, if you have a cut, if you have a problem, and these bacteria enter into your body, then you may have a problem. Okay? Now, the question will come, what do they do? Well, they participate in metabolism of food products. We know that. They also provide uh, essential growth factor like vitamin K. They basically protect us from infection. So they have taken up the spots on our body, which are critical spots, and they will not let the pathogenic bacteria to come over and take over. So they will kind of have that a, a barrier influence. And then again, finally, they do uh, teach our immune system and they stimulate the immune response. Okay. So the idea is that your microbial flora is in continual state of flux. So we are, there's a set of bacteria that we cannot remove from our body, but some of the bacteria will be acquired by, by the environment. If you kind of spend like eight hours a day in one or three, so you basically will acquire what is the norm over here. And if you tend to sit together for eight hours, seven hours, this one way or the other, then we call that a typical continual stage of flux that your bacteria will keep on rotating and, and moving on. Then again, it also depends upon your age, your diet, your hormone status, health, and personal hygiene. These are the other determinants of you having a set of uh, bacteria. As I said earlier, human fetus is a protective sterile environment. The moment the baby is born, and baby passes through the vaginal canal, and all those commensal of vagina will attach to the skin of the baby, right? And it is desired. It is desired that the baby gets the exposure. And you know why is it desired? Because baby already has a human IgG from the mother. So it's good for the baby to bond with her mother by picking up all those bacteria which are normal vaginal flora of the mother and educate her immune system accordingly. So we would argue that to have a C-section is unhealthy and a vaginal delivery is healthy because that will expose the baby and she will get the first set of microbes from her mother because she's going to take mother's milk, she's going to suck at mother's nipple, she's going to get close to mother's skin, and she's going to live with mother's skin. So she, she will acquire the normal commensal for bacteria for the mother. So it's good for her, the baby, to acquire that. So she basically picks up a good immune response. So this is how it works. Now on the flip side, if the mother has HIV, if the mother has a STD, 
and she has Neisseria, she has HIV in her, in her uh, so-called vaginal flora. We don't want the baby to pass through that canal because baby will acquire those diseases. And of course, we will deliver the baby by a C-section. So these are some of the things that you have to keep in mind. And uh, also keep in mind the very first thing that becomes colonized, so colonized means that bacteria will take over, is the skin of the baby, then oropharynx, gastrointestinal tract, and then other mucosa. So there's a series of events that go through from a sterile environment, from a uterus, to the world that baby comes in, okay? Now, also keep in mind that um, if you go to hospital, we want to cut down the heart because there are some of the organisms which are very commonly present in hospital. We call hospital-acquired infection, nosocomial infections. So the idea is they would rather treat you on outdoor basis and keep you in hospital for a lesser time no matter how clean the hospital looks like, there still are some bacteria and you may catch them, right? So that's another important thing. If you give too much antibiotics, so what will happen is, for example, you remove the normal bacteria and then so other bacteria will overgrow. So you, you change the balance. That leads to one of the uh, very important diseases, especially uh, the overzealous use of uh, antibiotics, we call it pseudomembranous colitis, and that happens where the normal bacteria, they res resist, restrict the growth of Clostridium difficile. So they would restrict the growth of Clostridium difficile, and if you give antibiotics, so you will kill the normal bacteria, and Clostridium difficile will overgrow, and with overgrow, it causes the problems, okay? The other important uh, concept is colonization versus disease. As I said, that uh, these bacteria are there on your person. They can sit on your person forever. That's fine. But unless and until they pass through your mucosa, unless and until you have a cut on the skin, and they go into the skin, they would or they should not produce a disease. So disease basically is produced when they are given an opportunity that they invade and go into you. So keep that in mind, that colonization, that's why I give an example that uh, if you pick up a bacteria from your mouth or any part of the body, the question you'll ask yourself, is this normal? Because presence of bacteria in different cavities or openings that we have may be considered as normal, okay? Now, when we say colonization, we basically can uh, talk of two different things. Is it colonization transient or per permanently? The whole idea is whether you acquire, so you get a rotation, you work in the hospital, there's nothing you can do, your immune system is good, hospital bugs will attack you, but they can stay on your body for temporary, but as long as they don't interfere with your normal body function, your good immune system, you are okay. But if it messes up your immune system, then again you will have a problem, and then you will have a disease. Okay? So the whole idea is disease occurs when these micro microbes, whether it be bacteria, viruses, fungi, or yeast, they get into your cells and the body, and they cause organ damage. Okay? And then again, uh, other important concept you have to have is that, uh, as I said, there's a sampling of this bacteria being done by your dendritic cells and antigen-presenting cells. So all your antigen-presenting cells at a given time, especially gastrointestinal tract, where you have maximum number of T cells, they are in continuously, continuously immunosurveillance. So they will survey your bacteria, and they have a data that they have registered these bacteria as normal flora. So your immune system would not react to it. Okay? So there's another we call immune education. But again, also keep in mind, as long as your host immune response doesn't, he's not going to respond to it because if he considers it to be self. Because in this case, 
your commensals are considered as self. Okay? No, now the other concept is that why do we get disease? Now, some of these bacteria we call, we use a term called strict pathogens. They cannot do good to you. So they are always troublemakers. Whether you find them or you don't find them, they are there to cause problems. We'd say strict pathogens. For example, Neisseria gonorrhea that causes gonorrhea. So if you find that, it's not going to cause something good. It's going to cause STD, as simple as that. So they are considered as strict pathogens. Mycobacterium tuberculosis. If you have mycotuberculosis, any part of your body, this is not normal. They cannot be your commensal. Okay? So let's review some of the list that we have. By definition, strict pathogens mean that they will always, they are always associated with disease. There's no question asked. And some of the list examples are mycobacterium tuberculosis, causing tuberculosis, Neisseria gonorrhea, causing gonorrhea, Francisella tularensis, causing tularemia, Plasmodium causing malaria, and rabies virus causing rabies. So if you do find them on any part of your body, be assured this is not normal. They are strict pathogens. Now, some of the, and actually most of the infections are caused by opportunistic pathogens. So they basically are your friends, but all of a sudden they decide to cause problem to you. So they are your friends as long as your immune system is okay. If your immune system is depressed, it goes down, there's a cut, there's an injury, there's an abrasion, then they will take over and they cause problems. And you can see from here, uh, Staphylococcus aureus, Ishirikia coli, and Candida albicans. And again, you just need to get used to these words because I'm going to talk about these in details anyway. So the idea is that these bacteria in their normal settings would not cause a disease. But if you introduce them into unprotected sites by a cut, abrasion, or a depressed immune system, they will cause a disease. Okay? Now, also keep in mind that when we say we can culture bacteria, also keep, in, keep that in mind, this culture means based upon the techniques that we have. But most of the microbiologists believe that there still are some bacteria that we cannot culture, but they are there. Because we can only find this bacteria if we can culture them. You know, that's what we call the tip of iceberg. So there are more population of bacteria than we think there is. Okay? That's why they wanted to go for a human micro, microbiome project, I told you. And they have done it for a set of population, but they would introduce it uh, to the rest of the population. And uh, I just want you to know that what they have done so far is that they have taken upper respiratory tract as one, one area. They have taken skin as a second area. They have taken gastrointestinal tract as the third area, and they have taken urogenital tract as fourth area. The whole idea behind this concept is that the bacteria, viruses, and fungi sitting in these places are responsible for the diseases that occur in this particular uh, systems. So they want to find out the role uh, of these diseases, and that's basically my part of research as well. So you can see, uh, this is from the NIH website, I told you. So what they have done is that they wanted to create like a gene bank. So they would take uh, swabs from nasal cavity, oral cavity, and run them. They take swab, swab from skin, swab from urogenital area, and run for the norms. So they will pick up population group, and will develop these norms. And then they will take the patients and then compare it. OK? So I think. Uh, <clears throat> You can ask yourself a question, uh, which of the following sites of the human body does not have a normal flora, right? Of course, blood, blood should not have a normal flora. The other question is that uh, which of the following is not among commensal population of anterior urethra? No, you need to know that. Because you just said the commonest problem, especially in female, is UTI, very common. 
UTI, urinary tract infection is very common in females. And then again, you ask the patient to give you a clean catch midstream urine specimen. So they have to wash their anterior urethra and they have to catch the middle stream specimen. You want to find out if they have really UTI. And then you run those bacteria and you find out that it has Streptococcus, Corani bacteria, Lactobacilli, coagulase negative Staphylococci. Now, as a physician or as a person who is there, you need to find out which of them should not be there, regardless of how clean the midstream specimen is, because vagina has its own normal flora and anal canal has its own flora, and they are in perineum. So they are, these kind of bacteria cannot be detached. Can somebody guess? Especially the one who studied that ahead of me. Which one of uh, this should not be considered as a normal flora? Corani bacteria. Corani bacteria. So that's again important. So the idea is you need to know which is normal before you go to find out which is abnormal. So that's some of the things that I want you to make sure. Okay, uh, let me run through some of the important things and then you can uh, do your memorization afterwards. Uh, upper respiratory tract, simple concept. A bacteria which is sitting on the upper respiratory tract, the reason is because this bacteria wants to breathe. So they basically are aerobic bacteria. So they are aerobic bacteria because if they don't have oxygen, they will die. And the most common are Streptococcus haemophilus and Neisseria. But they also have some anaerobic bacteria which can also cause disease. So when we look at those specimens, we look for all the detail. Okay. Uh, the commonest cause of plaque, I know most of us have problem with our uh, uh, teeth and you have plaque and loss of, so it is coming from bacteria. So bacteria is there, which normally is avirulent, and it is forming something on your teeth we call biofilm. And no matter how much gargle you do, brush you do, whatever you do, there's nothing you can do for the biofilm. We'll talk about that in detail. But these are bacteria which will kind of chew your tooth and call dental tooth decay, right? And then also many times people struggle with the, with the smell that comes from their mouth. And this smell, anything that smell comes from any of the opening, that's because of bacteria ferment fermentation. So that's because of the bacteria, they are sitting over there and producing that. So that again uh, is important for us to know. Uh, there are fungi as well, candida is very common in the mouth. There are parasites as well, antamoeba and trichomonas, they are also present in the respiratory tract. So what I would want you to know is that at least a couple of bacteria which should be uh, as a normal flora for each and every part of the body and then find out what are the pathogenic organisms that can, can cause disease. Because when we teach you, the question I'm going to ask you, what name the bacteria which will always cause disease in upper respiratory tract. And you can see these are the bacteria that are responsible for causing upper respiratory tract infections. We, when we say infection, we talk of upper respiratory tract infection, we talk of lower respiratory tract infections. And you can see strep, staph, Neisseria, Haemophilus, Morexala and Enterobacteriaceae. So these are very common that you normally see in clinical practice. Okay. I did mention about the uh, concept of colonization versus disease. So you can have an idea that you're not picking up a bacteria which should normally be there. Okay. Uh, those of you who are interested, that again, is probiotics is again a big discussion point for people who uh, are interested in maintain, maintaining a healthy bacteria. So you can keep a healthy bacteria on your skin. Again, uh, if you look at ear, the most common is coagulase negative staphylococci. If you look at eye, again, coagulase negative staphylococci. And the reason being, because ear and eye are in continuous proximity with the skin. So your skin kind of goes over there, right? But if you look at the lower respiratory tract, for example, you will see that uh, as a rule, uh, lower respiratory tract should be sterile. If it's not sterile, then there's a problem there. Then you have respiratory infection. 
So if you have bacteria in your mouth, you cannot have upper respiratory tract infection. But if you have bacteria in your lower respiratory tract, you have a respiratory infection. And again, the most virulent mean, the one that causes most damage, are uh, staph pneumonia and staph aureus. And then again, there are a couple of other, but very common strep and strep are there. Also keep in mind another concept that you may think that only one bacteria will cause one disease. That may not happen. Right? So who stops from two bacteria to cause a disease or 10 bacteria to cause a disease? So many a time we see a picture which is called polymicrobial disease. So there are a bunch of bacteria. They decide all together to, to cause a problem to you. And then you can see polymicrobial disease. So you have to use an antibiotic against all of them. So that's another important thing. Uh, gastrointestinal tract, I usually give an example that uh, even to such an extent for the motherhood baby bonding, uh, most of the pediatricians and neonatologists will uh, even suggest that the mother take something, chew it in her mouth and give it to the baby. So the very first thing that the baby acquires uh, for her normal flora of the gastrointestinal tract should be mother's saliva containing mother's bacteria because she's going to have mother's milk eventually. So that basically shows you the concept over here. You want to colonize uh, your bacteria and these studies have been linked to quite a few important researches. So you can see from here uh, the moment you start ingesting food, water, everything, uh, that basically uh, will determine as to what kind of food are you taking. And then again, is the protective mechanisms that we have. Now, the upper part of the body, mouth and upper respiratory tract. Then if you go down esophagus, uh, because esophagus is a tract where food moves on. So even if you have a bacteria there, the bacteria will be transient. They cannot establish permanent residence because of the what happens in esophagus that would not allow the bacteria to sit over there permanently. What is the physiological mechanism that's happening in esophagus? Peristalsis. Very good. Peristalsis. Because it continues motion. So you have to move on. So what may happen is, but you still get esophagitis. Uh, mostly it's candida, herpes simplex virus, and cytomegalovirus. They are responsible. So viruses and fungi are more responsible for causing esophagitis. That's the cause of the disease. Now, common simple question, what kind of bacteria do you think can thrive in stomach? Acid tolerant, because acid is a two, is HCl, very strong acid. So any other bacteria cannot thrive over here. And what are the names of those acid tolerant bacteria? Helicobacter pylori, Campylobacter jejuni. So these are the commonest things that we normally see because they have learned over time, and I don't know if any of you have been to the Yellowstone Park. Have you been to Yellowstone Park? Are you been to? So you see that uh, faithful geyser or whatever that is? So when it uh, erupts, so that has a boiling water there. So they found out that some of the bacteria are still there. So they can tolerate that temperature. So bacteria have learned over time to kind of find the right ecosystem to thrive. So that's the whole idea they can do so. But also keep in mind, if you, I'm, I've heard from many patients of mine as well, oh, you know, I got acidity, so I'm using uh, these kind of antacid for the last five years. So what's happening to these patients? If you're using antacid for the rest of your life, you basically are giving a chance of bacteria to thrive in your stomach because stomach would not have an acid there. So you are reducing the, you know, kind of acidity of the stomach. So that's a problem there. This should not happen because this against uh, the normal physiology of the stomach. Does that make sense? All right. Small intestine, again, uh, you have bacteria, fungi, and parasites. Most of the time we see common causes of gastroenteritis, salmonella, campylobacter, but the important thing is that sometimes these bacteria are present, we call asymptomatic, and they don't cause disease because they have not penetrated the mucosa. So they need to penetrate the mucosa. And one of the things that they may require is that they have to build up a critical mass. 
So one bacteria cannot cause a problem. You have to have like 1,000 bacteria to make sure to invade and cause problem. So that's why you need, need to uh, make sure that they reach that clinical lab test. Uh, large intestine, I already uh, saw feces are nothing but bacteria. So you can imagine the public lavatories, washrooms, and so on and so forth, uh, what is happening there in terms of uh, people acquiring those uh, bacteria over there. But again, uh, parasites and other things are also important. Now, having said that, I don't know who did I give Ishirika coli as a presentation. That actually is one of the, the most important um, uh, bacteria because E. coli is present in virtually all human beings from birth until death. So that is our system has evolved over time, right? And it represents 1% of intestinal population. So the number is low. But again, if you increase the percentages of these bacteria, so they will outnumber the norms and then will cause problem. And then again, you can see from here some of the most common aerobic organism responsible for intra-abdominal disease, especially when you have an operation for the intestine. And uh, again, a very severe form of the disease we normally see. Okay. Uh, some of the organisms are normally present. B. fragilis, we'll discuss that in detail, but that's very, very important. In the last five minutes, I'll just go through genetry genital urinary system because, uh, again, especially for standpoint of uh, immunology and standpoint of your clinical practice, um, you're going to see a lot of patients. As I say, UTI, vaginitis, every, I mean, will be like 99.9%. You never ever see a female patient who has had not uh, UTI or vaginitis. Very common. And the reason is because these anatomic areas have permanently colonized with microbes. So they are permanently colonized. The only thing that you have to keep in mind is that uh, as long as, sorry? <laughs> so as long as the bacteria don't pass through the cervix and move up, right? We are okay, but if they start moving up, then there is a this is called a retrograde infection, and you can see from here, uh, flushing action of voided urine is important. But since female have a small urethra as compared to male, so they are more prone to infection as compared to males. Male will ro very rarely have UTI infection. If they have UTI infection, reason is STD. The chances are STD, but in women, very common, very common, and you can see that. Uh, if it goes, we call ascending infection, if it actually uh, goes from there, because sometimes what happens is, then we'll discuss the detail when I teach you vaginitis, that um, some of the aspects of having the normal flora is important because of the proximity of uh, genital uterine tract together. So if you look at anterior urethra, for example, these are commensal population. Lactobacilli, the most important, bacteria there. We have streptococci, coagulase negative staphylococci, that's there from the skin as well because of labia majora and minora are part of the skin. Then uh, the important point is that these organisms are avirulent and rarely associated with human disease. So these one, if you find, they are avirulent, mean lack of virulence, but they won't cause a disease. But at the same time, uh, because of proxi proximity of anal canal with vagina and uterus, there are chances that the fecal organism may enter into UTI uh, causing infection. And you can see that there's tons of enterococcus and all these are important and they basically can multiply in urine and lead to significant disease. And some of the pathogens like N. gonorrhea, uh, chlamydia trachomatis, which is number one STD in this part of the world, STD, uh, I would say like whole world, uh, chlamydia, very common STD among females, and that is the cause of urethritis. And then the problem with that is that many of the females will be asymptomatic. They will feel that uh, there's nothing going on, and they will pass it on to their sexual partners, and so on and so forth. And then you can see from here, uh, you need to know what is the uh, anterior urethra population in normal population. Uh, I already talked about uh, non-cultivated microbes. I talked about if you give overzealous treatment for uh, some of the diseases, you may have a pseudomembranous colitis, and uh, 
the whole idea behind is if you give an antibiotics you will remove your friends and you will give your enemies a chance to take over right and then again uh, the whole idea will be that there's a set of population for these bacteria so it like you have 100 good bacteria if you kill 50 of them 50 will be replaced by by pathogenic and then we'll have a problem there okay so that's the basis for that and I'll stop here and uh, do um, um, I think I've, I've got a couple of slides, uh, microbial flora of vagina, urethra, and some other aspects that I'll discuss tomorrow because they are related to quite a few diseases that we see in our clinical practice. Okay?